several things going this morning with our message, with our series. The bottom line is given to us out of Hebrews. And we already have talked about it. It talks about building. But every house has a builder. The builder of all things is God. And I see that as our theme, not only for the message, not only for the series, but also I see that for our lives, and certainly as a theme for this year. And so when we talk about building, there's so many things that we can look at as far as what's going on right now here at Word of Life. What's going on right now in our families as we see families grow, as we see families get, may I say, stronger. Stronger in the things that are so important to the Lord, as I see as I see individuals from all different backgrounds, and even not here because of geographically not being able to be here, they're part of this, what is building. It is a blessing by God. It's not something just to pat ourselves on the back, but it is something that will lead us, as God leads us, to something which we can offer and will offer to the Lord. The life center, the building itself, and I see so much action and so much activity going on and, and people coming forward and saying, I can do that, and, and people getting organized for an auction so that we can raise necessary dollars for that. I see that happening, and this is certainly a building that is going to be so important to that dream, to that vision that God is giving us, so that we can be a beacon of light in our community. And as a life center, we can invite people in, and we can develop a relationship. But I see that the building, the actual building that God is doing is all of that plus the building of a relationship with us. God is a just God. God is an honest God. God wants us to be truthful. God wants us to be helpful to each other. God wants our society to not be corrupt but wants our society to be a society that reflects the hand of God through the people that he has called through us, the followers of Jesus. And we do have some struggle with that right now. And so the brave new world, the brave new world that Aldous Huxley talks about, talks about people not, not having, no longer having children. 500 years from now, no longer having children. The children are, 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 are brought up and in devices so that women never have to go through that pain of, of giving birth. And I don't know what happens to the children. I haven't gotten that far into the movie, but they are suddenly changed from little children to 35-year-olds, which they stay until they're about 85, and then they're taken, they depart, they're departed. That's his world that he envisioned. I think somewhat to scare the heck out of people as far as what we do not want it to be and what I know, I know that God would not let it be. So here we are, this brave new world that we live in with a lot of things going on that looks so attractive, but it's deceptive. It's deceptive. But you notice how deceptive it is, and society can be the same type of deception where everything, because everybody perhaps is doing it, uh, it seems like the thing that, uh, that will, will raise you up as far as maybe your status is concerned. Uh, and, and then society is so good about it. TV programs that, that uh, you know, just, just build you, just bring you into th this type of lifestyle. Things that you really appreciate the humor of, and, but it's not, it's not reality. It's not what God wants. Again, God builds all things. Again, God wants us to have, to live honestly, to have rules, to have a just world. And our world has so much injustice to it, caused a lot by people saying lies, saying lies long enough so that lies get to be believed. Tragic, isn't it? But yet the scriptures tell us, do not be conformed. Do not be drawn in, do not be, but, but rather to be brought to the Lord. Let's take a look at our text. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and what is acceptable, and what is perfect. 
In the New Testament, we have at least three places where the Greek word can be translated, transform. But what does transformation mean? How does it happen? And that brings us to what is it like to be broken down? When I say that, I, re I remember a few times it was broken down on the highway. I don't like that. <laughs> Especially at that particular time, I didn't have any insurance where I could call and get some, and get some help. Especially at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, on a lonely highway someplace, with no jack in the car, with a little baby besides a, a young wife that was uh, very, very, very quiet at that time, but a little scared. <laughs> Oh, I just love it when I have an audience. Anyway, <laughs> but we're not, we're not talking about that broken down, are we? What we're talking about is when we have no place to turn. And I think that's where it's really important to make a decision or to make a, a, a definition to, to, be, to define it in such a way that broken down doesn't mean broken down like hurt, don't know where to turn, don't have any hope, but rather it means brokenness. And brokenness says, I only have one place to turn, and that is the Lord. Now, I don't know how you can translate this into something which is applicable to you right now in your situation, but I'm asking you to do that as we talk about a couple of people from the Old Testament. Well, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. And their moments of being broke down, their moments of being in a position of needing Christ, needing God to come into their lives. The first one I'd like to share with you is a very familiar one for most of you, and that's Moses. You perhaps know this, but Moses was brought up in, as, as an Israelite. He was brought up in the Pharaoh's house. And so he was given an Egyptian uh, education, and so he could speak Egyptian. Kind of sounds funny as we say it here, but he could speak the, the language of the land. He also apparently could speak Hebrew. Perhaps he could, perhaps he could not. But he knew by the time he was age 40 that he was by Hebrew by birth. And so that led him to defending very poor judgment of where he did it and how he did it, but to defending another Israelite who was being beaten by a by a, an Egyptian. And, and protecting him so much, which we need to do, we need to protect the innocent, but this was wrong, because he not only protected this innocent, but he killed the Egyptian. When the Pharaoh found out about that, he was angry, and so as a true warrior, he fled, Moses fled. Yeah, you catch it. He was not a true warrior at that time. He left. His options, I guess, were not a whole lot, but he left and he went to the desert, and there he met his wife, and he met a father-in-law that was helpful to him, and he was a shepherd, and he was now this prince who was a shepherd. You talk about being broken down. He was broken down, and then God comes in this, this special way with fire in this bush, and this fire does not go out. And God tells him, I have chosen you. And Moses says, no, not me. No, not me. Lord, are you sure? Yeah. And in his brokenness, Moses was lifted up. In his brokenness, Moses was lifted up so that he came at the age of 80 back to Egypt and led the children of Israel out of their captivity. Peter. Don't you love Peter? Peter could say all the right things, but then follow up maybe just a few minutes later by saying all the wrong things, always getting himself seemingly in trouble by not being smart enough to know when he should just listen. And that's what we love about Peter, and that's what we can identify with Peter, I think, ourselves, and that we can see how we do the same thing. And of course, Peter was the one who had so many of the right answers. And Peter also said, Lord, no, we will never leave you. We will never forsake you. We will defend you. And he pulled his sword. And God said, put the sword away. But he said, we will defend you. But then Jesus predicted that he would, Peter would deny him three times before the crow, the rooster would crow. Three times. And so Peter did that. He denied Christ, broken. And in his brokenness, not knowing for sure what was happening, 
when he heard word that this Jesus Christ who was in this tomb had risen and their tomb was empty. And so he runs to the tomb and he sees that the tomb in his brokenness, he sees that the tomb is empty. And so what does he think and feel? And he sees Jesus, and Jesus welcomes him. And then there's a special time that Peter was bored, and so he says, let's go fishing. And he was out in the boat, and he sees this man on the shoreline, and, and the man calls out to him and says, have you caught fish? And he says, no. And he said, throw your net on the other side. And he says, okay. And he pulls out all of these fish. And he knows that this is the Lord. And in his position of being broken, at least being having brokenness, he rushes and he sees his Lord and he falls at his knees and he worships Jesus Christ his Savior as we in our brokenness also. Wow. And then Peter goes through the actions. Jesus takes him through the actions of pulling him away from being conformed to his own natural uh, uh, lack of of, of strength and courage so he couldn't stand up for this Christ. He couldn't say the truth at that time. He lied three times, but then Jesus does brings him around. He totally changes Peter all over as he changes us over. And he says, not, Peter, now, I want you to follow these rules. I want you to follow the Ten Commandments. I want you to follow everything and do this perfectly. You know, he says, no, 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 Jesus doesn't do that to us, does he? He reformats us. He reformatted Peter by asking, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And he asked him again, Lord, you know I love you. And he asked him again, feed my sheep. That's what it means. That's what the text means. That's what the text means when it says, do not be conformed, but be transformed be transformed. And so we look for those opportunities and we look for those places. We look for that those things that are happening in our life. We don't look for disappointments or frustrations or difficult times. In fact, we pray for the opposite, and we should. But yet, as we are transformed, we have this ability, this ability to live a life to His glory, to live a life without fear without fear as far as where we are headed and what society is telling us that, that and the, the wrong message does not pull us in. At times, perhaps it does. But we turn away from it because we are transformed. God has given us that ability. It's exciting. So we look at another individual who was broken. He bled. He had a crown of thorns pressed upon his head. He had a spear shoved into his side. He died. And the beautiful word is that in his dying, as Christ died, he died with him. And as he rose, we rose with him. That's what the scriptures tell us. That's what the scriptures open up. That's what it means to be transformed. So this wonderful servant, this beautiful God, man, who came to this world, who walked on this world, and there's proof as the, as the disciples and the apostles shared that proof in their lives, as they shared it in what they then became, and Peter being able to stand in front of the 3,000 in Jerusalem and being able to answer them, they said, what should we do? And he said, confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, and be baptized, and believe. Ah, there's a lot of building going on, isn't there? There's a lot of building. So where are we, and how do we take this and make it personal? Because this is all personal. Jesus wants justice. He wants truth. He wants honesty. He wants a world that operates under those rules. And when it doesn't, it's wrong. And when it doesn't, there will be people that are hurt, sometimes innocent people. But that is not God's will. And through his followers, through his believers, his will is done. And that's what we are called to do as transformed, transformed believers and followers of Christ. So personally, where do you take it? How do you use it? Well, one thing is that when sadness comes into your life, as it has into Amber's life in a special way, as sadness came into the Wallace man, Wallace's wife in a special way, their father's 
just a few last pass days uh, were taken to their heavenly home. Well, how do we handle that? How do we, as brothers and sisters of those, work with them and walk with them and pray for them? And you know the answer. We know the answer because we can share that we are transformed and those individuals that we're praying for, the families that we're praying for, know that their loved ones were transformed and were believers. Praise God. Jesus said, and one of the last things that I was able to say to Kent was that in the scriptures, Jesus said to the disciples, do not be anxious. I go to prepare a place for you. And we are not to be anxious because God has prepared a place for us. I want to give you an illustration. It's a little different kind of illustration. It's one that I just recently saw uh, on uh, a series that's, that's been on TV for quite a while, but we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't seen it, or at least we never got caught up with it. And so we were complaining to our family, as we, as we do to our sons and daughters and daughter-in-law, our son and daughter-in-law and our daughter and son-in-law. We were complaining about uh, not seeing anything on TV that we liked anymore. Well, the sports are great. You know, we got a couple to watch this afternoon. The sports are great, and sometimes the news is okay, uh, and sometimes there's just a nice program, a nice movie that we can watch. But we, we, were, we were feeling sorry for ourselves. And so for a Christmas present, we were given an instrument, and I'm not even sure if I can pronounce it correctly. Uh, let's see, a Roku? Roku? Yeah, they didn't even know about it. And so now we can go back and we can, and we can listen to uh, the series that has been on for quite a while, uh, which is uh, uh, Downton. Am I saying that right? Yeah. 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 So some of you have seen that? Yeah. OK. And so here it is, this, this, this 1912, over 100 years ago, episode, which is talking about how people that were, that were their royalty were living and how their staff was living. And it's interesting, very interesting. The Earl, who's a very good man, and this is the illustration. <coughs> The Earl had a decision that he had to make because he had just hired somebody to be his valet. And this person was, had fought with him in, in a previous war and was a friend of his because of the war experience. The Earl, of course, would have been an officer and, and the friend would not have been an officer. But that's the way it was in those, those years. And so at this particular point, this friend comes and he comes and he has a noticeable handicap. He's using a can. He he's not, doesn't have a perfect walk. He has a little shaky walk. And so, and so this is a cantankerous group of staff. They plot, they plot that we've got to get rid of this guy because he's not, he doesn't look good for us. And besides, there was a villain who wanted that job and he didn't get it. And so he was working behind the scenes. So the Earl goes to this man and says, I want you to be successful. And he says, well, I want to be successful too. In a couple days, however, the butler uh, comes, who is in charge of the whole staff, comes and says, he's just not working, okay? He said, all right. So he meets, the, the Earl then meets with his valet, and he breaks the truth, he breaks the decision down to him. And they talk a little bit. And they say, nope, that's it. And so the next morning, this 1910 or so automobile pulls up, and there's another guest, that, that uh, a duke, that gets on it. And in the front goes this valet. And he is going, he doesn't, you know, he has a handicap. He doesn't have a job. He's already told that I don't think I can find another job. And so the Earl is standing there. And the illustration is this. He says goodbye. And the car starts pulling away. And the Earl follows the car, shouts to the chauffeur to stop the car, and tells his friend to get out. He says, we're not going to talk about it. You're staying. And so the friend, without shaking his hands, because he just didn't do that with an Earl, shaking his hands, walks by, walks back into the room, rehired. And here's what the Earl said. He said this to the Bible. He said, it just didn't feel right. Amen? Amen.